Welcome to today's Feast Your Mind lunchtime lecture. Today we're going to talk about physics and the electric guitar, and specifically pickups and the generator effect. So, what do a Fender Stratocaster electric guitar, the Elephant and Castle, an old Victorian gentleman, wind turbines, and a big old coal-fired power station have in common. Essentially, it all boils down to the Victorian gentleman. His name is Michael Faraday, and along with Isaac Newton and a chap called James Clark Maxwell, who is another scientist involved in electricity, those were the three photographs that Albert Einstein had up in his office. He considered them to be the greatest scientists who ever lived. Now, Michael Faraday was born in 1791. To the, he was the son of a blacksmith who had come down from Yorkshire looking for work. And he was born around the Elephant Castle, or what is now the Elephant Castle. At the time, it was called Newington Butts. And you can see the shape of the map is the same. Um, if you look closely there, uh, lots of fields you can see. is uh, not quite so built up as it is now. So young Michael would have had a, a bit more room to run around and play in. But we're not worried about his childhood here. He became, by dint of his own work and application, and particularly reading books, because he was apprenticed to a bookbinder when he was 14, not a great deal of education, but he read the books that he bound, and a lot of them were scientific. And then he went along to the Royal Institution, listened to lectures by a chap called Humphrey Davy, and made copious notes, and eventually got a job with Davy, and went on from there to become a great scientist in his own right. Now, one of the things that Michael Faraday discovered, uh, which keeps the electricity flowing to this day, is that if you move a conductor, an electrical conductor, through a magnetic field, you also move the electrons within the conductor. Those delocalized electrons will move. And if you move it the other way, they'll move back. Not necessarily particularly earth-shattering in that animation, but it's the basis for all, almost all our electricity generation. On the left at the top there, we've got a picture of, um, or a schematic, of a wind turbine. So the uh, propeller blades go to a gearbox, or they drive a shaft which goes to a gearbox, which drives a generator at much higher speed. And all that's doing is moving magnetic magnets um, around within a shell made of, uh, of conductors, so lots of wires, or it's moving the conductors inside the magnets. It doesn't really matter as long as they're moving relative to each other. Uh, same thing's happening in the coal-fired power station. We've got a turbine which is driven by steam generated by the coal burning and uh, boiling water, and that turns the magnets inside the conductors and generates electricity, a poten huge potential difference which comes to our homes and factories. Uh, and no doubt we'll learn more about that as we go through physics. But we're not talking about the detail of that at the moment. We're talking about electric guitars. Now, what has this got to do with generators? Well, imagine in the 1920s or possibly 30s, I'm not sure when this photograph is from, but it's a big dance hall. Now, trumpets and saxophones and things could cut through all that noise, but a guitar, not so much. You're playing an acoustic guitar at the back of the room. It won't get heard. There's too many feet, too much talking. So what can, you, what can you do? Well, you could stick a microphone in front of it. An acoustic guitar, I strum away, the signal will go into the microphone, to the amplifier where that signal gets boosted, and then get out to the speaker. But as dances got bigger and uh, crowds got louder, there was a problem with that. The more you turn it up, the more the sound comes out of the speaker and straight back into the microphone, where it starts feeding back, which sounds a little bit like this. and it's not really a very nice sound. So a new way had to be found of getting the sound from the guitar, from the strings of the guitar, amplifying them, getting them out to the speakers, but in a way that would not promote that horrible feedback sound. And that's what we're talking about today. Pickups, see that little sort of bar thing pointed out by the arrow? That is a pickup on a Fender Stratocaster. Now the first electric guitar pickup was invented and patented by a guy called George Beecham. And his guitar didn't look much like a guitar, but it didn't have to because it had a pickup on it to pick up the sounds. 
Um, and this is one of his original patent drawings. It says filed June the 2nd, 1934. And you can see up at the top there, there's some little bar magnets and, uh, and a coil of wire going around it. But let's have a look at a picture of the pickups on a Stratocaster. So you can see individual magnets, they're called pole pieces in um, pickup terminology, but they're little, just little bar magnets lined up um, top to bottom. Um, there's six of them, one for each string. On a bass guitar, there'll be four. Um, and wrapped around those, there's a few thousand turns of enameled copper wire. So that's the conductor in the magnetic field. The enameling means that the uh, essentially it's just one huge long piece of, uh, of wire. They don't touch, there's no conduction between the individual coils. So it's one giant long long bit of wire. So that there's loads and loads of turns within that magnetic field. Now, I used to think, I had a misconception and I decided to test it. So I'll, I'll demonstrate my misconception first and then show you what I did to, uh, to test it. So I thought that when you move a conductor in a magnetic field, so that's the string vibrating, And there's the electrons vibrating in sympathy as the string goes through the, uh, through the magnetic field. So what I thought was the, that creates its own uh, magnetic field because it's a current, moving current. We know that moving currents create uh, magnetic fields. And I thought we had an oscillating magnetic field so that any conductor would do. I thought a copper wire on an electric guitar would be fine. I thought that would work. Um, so I thought the, you know, we've got our oscillating magnetic field and then you've got the coil underneath where the electrons also vibrate in sympathy because of that oscillating magnetic field. And I thought, okay, that's what gets amplified and we hear the sound coming out. So I thought I'd test that because I've never actually tested it and uh, this is what I came up with. So here we're gonna do an actual test of ferromagnetic and non-magnetic materials used to make a sound on an electric guitar pickup. You can see there I've got a pure copper um, string. It's not actually a string, it's a piece of earthing wire from when some electricians did some work in the house, which I've had left over for several years. Um, and I've also got a bit of bicycle brake cable. The bicycle brake cable is properly ferromagnetic. I don't know if you can see this. So this little neodymium magnet pulls it, so it is ferromagnetic, here's the copper, nothing. So, hooked up to an amplifier, it goes ping, but that's just the acoustic sound of that string going. Put the brake cable over the pickup, it's not even very tight, and you can hear that sound coming out of the amplifier, well out of the speaker. So, electric guitar strings need to be ferromagnetic if they're using this sort of pickup. So what that experiment means is that electric guitar strings having to be ferromagnetic, the string itself is pulling the magnetic field from the, uh, the magnets in the pickup. It's pulling it around as it vibrates. Just try an animation to show you what's happening there. To start with, the field lines are straight and pretty much parallel. Once you get a, a little way away from the, um, from the magnet, we can assume that. It's just for illustrative purposes. Once we put a piece of ferromagnetic material in there, like a ferromagnetic guitar string, you can see all those field lines preferentially travel through that piece of ferromagnetic material because it gets magnetized. So imagine you're putting two bar magnets together, a north and a south pole together those field lines will join up and they'll go through from north to south. And that's exactly what's happening here. When the string starts to vibrate, when one plays a note, those field lines will travel with the, uh, the ferromagnetic guitar string. So they're altering, as the string vibrates, it's altering the magnetic field. And so, any conductor, like the copper wire wrapped around the, uh, the magnet in the pickup, 
the magnetic field that that copper wire is sitting in is fluctuating. That will generate a fluctuating potential difference in the coil, and it's that fluctuating potential difference that gets amplified, and that's what we hear. Guitars with single coil pickups like this, and particularly Stratocasters, have been played by some of my greatest guitar heroes. First, there was The Shadows, and their song Apache was the first Shadows song I ever heard on the first album I bought. Um, then there's Jimi Hendrix, um, who really ought to need no introduction, absolutely astonishing player. Uh, Nile Rogers, who's still going strong, um, another great player. And crusty old rock god, Richie Blackmore, uh, probably my greatest uh, influence growing up. But there's a problem with the single coil pickup. The other side of the coin from the fact that uh, when we pass the conductor through a magnetic field we get a current is that when we pass a current through a conductor we get a magnetic field. What that means is that from things like transformers in the wall, fluorescent lights and computer screens there's a lot of stray um, radio frequency electromagnetic radiation uh, coming out usually at about 50 hertz and you can hear that now. It's not a nice sound gets into the pickups and can be difficult to get rid of. But relatively early on in the development of the electric guitar, the problem was solved. How did they solve it? They came up with a pickup called a humbucker. How does a humbucker work? Well, you can see that it's got two coils on it and two sets of magnets. Now if where the screws are, we can adjust the screws to change the height of, the, uh, of the, the, the pickup pieces to get that magnetic field closer to the strings. The other one isn't adjustable. And you find that if one row is all north poles at the top, the other row will all be south poles. So how does that help us? So let's look at a simplified diagram. Here's very simple coils with just one turn of wire with a north pole in one direction, or a north pole for one and a south pole for the other. So you can see that the current generated in each, or the potential difference, um, it's going in opposite directions for each coil, because one's a north pole and the other's a south pole. It stands to reason. And if we superimpose on that our 50 hertz hum, the 50 hertz hum, because it's only to do with the coil acting as an antenna, that will be going in the same direction in each coil. So we need to find a way of joining that signal together and cancelling out the 50 hertz hum. Now, if we join them just one after the other, we can see that the, uh, the 50 hertz hum adds up, which isn't what we want, just makes a stronger hum, and the sounds that we want, which are indicated by the red arrows, cancel each other out. They're going in opposite directions. So that's no good. All we'd be left with is a load of 50 hertz hum, which is which wouldn't be very entertaining. So, what was realized, again, I think it was later on in the 1930s, if they took those two coils and joined them in opposite directions, they sort of twist it over and join it back. It's a bit like one of those uh, round tents that you have to sort of twist over and when you push it back together and it's terribly difficult to get into the, uh, into the bag. But you can see there, it's a sort of infinity loop, and it just goes round one after the other. And if we look at that, we can see that those arrows are going in the same direction as they were before, but instead of cancelling each other out, they're now, the red arrows are now reinforcing each other, because you can just follow it round in the loop, and those 50 hertz hums cancel each other out. And that's called common mode rejection. So if two signals coming in with the same sort of interference. If you can wire them out of phase, very often you can get rid of the unwanted interference. And that's pretty much the end of this lecture. Um, no great conclusions, um, other than that if you are um, in charge of the physics, if you've got your mind around it, and you've got a problem to solve, you may well be able to enlist physics in solving your problem and get on with the mo more important fun of playing electric guitars, or whatever it is that you do. Uh, physics will very often come to your aid if there's an issue.